Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Eric. And this is The The Service Design Design Show. With The Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are shaping the service design field. We talk about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and the challenges up ahead. My guests in this episode are Eric Flowers and Megan Miller. Uh, They are the co-founders of the website called practicalservicedesign.com. They are both in-house service designer. Megan works at Stanford University and uh, Eric at Intuit. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be talking about topics like why is jobs to be done the hottest thing on the Slack channel with practical service design? We'll be talking about when will cyber services be ready for service design? And of course, we'll also talk about the ultimate practicality of service design. So if you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. Welcome to the show, Eric and Megan. Hello. Hi. Great to have you uh, here from, uh, you're in the Bay Area right now. Yep. At, at yep. Stanford, actually, right? It's a yep. beautiful sunny day today. Yeah, and um, it's, it's very, very nice to, to have you. Um, Eric and Megan, a uh, question for both of, you, both of you. Do you remember your very first encounter with service design? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do. So in... 2013, I took Adaptive Paths UX intensive training, and they actually have a whole day as part of that dedicated to service design. And it really felt very new, and especially to everyone in the audience. We were in Seattle, and um, they were really just introducing the blueprinting concepts and and this kind of end to end experience lens. And it was it really shaped. The direction of my last several years and my career. How about you, yeah. Eric? Yeah, I have a similar uh, story. I had been playing around with a new um, kind of deeper format of persona journey mapping that ended up looking a lot like a service blueprint. I didn't know it at the time, and I ended up at the managing experience conference in early 2013, where. Um, in the workshop, the term service blueprint was brought up and I'd, I'd never heard it before. And so I went home and researched and decided, wow, service design, this is what I wanted to do and have been trying to do, but I didn't know that there was a, uh, a school of thought and resources and real specific things. And so I actually literally made a decision to say, all right, my old career is over and this is what I do now. I, I need to figure out how to transition. That was three and a half years ago. How, and how did that transition work out for you? Um, I'm going to say it was a success. The, uh, the uh, butterfly has left the cocoon and is flying now. Um, and it was, it, it was really all due to just one certain um, person who hired me on kind of a leap of faith of, okay, so we don't really know what service design is, but we know we want to bring it to this company. I met her at a service design conference, and a month later, I moved halfway across the company to take my first job as an official service designer, just like that. You created your own job at that moment. Pr- pretty much, yeah, with, in a place where it was completely unknown and with no definition at all. Awesome. Um, I, I would almost say congratulations. <laughs> so, um, uh, Eric and uh, Megan, let's explain the format to the people that haven't seen any of the previous episodes. And we're going to co-create the questions that we're going to talk about. And um, I have a stack of papers with some topics here. And you also have a stack of papers, but with question starters. Yeah. Um, I'll pick one of these topics that you provided me and you'll pick one of the question started I provided you and then we'll have to co-create a question. Easy as that is. All right. Uh, let me go through the, uh, yeah, 
Let me just start with this one because this is probably very close to your heart and very dear to your heart. It's the topic of ultimate practicality, which question starter goes along with that one and who will answer that? <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, start the question and Megan can answer it. Go ahead. Why? Megan, why is ultimate practicality one of the topics that we want to talk about today? Well, so if you're familiar with the work that Eric and I have been doing collaboratively at practicalservicedesign.com, our whole MO is about bringing practicality to the field. For both of us who have you know, recently in the last three years made transitions from doing UX design to doing service design, making that transition was extremely hard. Uh, there isn't a big community out here in the U.S., particularly here in Silicon Valley. Um, companies haven't really heard of this yet. Uh, when you talk about it with your peers, they get a blank stare. <laughs> uh, so service design, we wanted to create a bridge from this theoretical um, <clears throat> high-level idea of designing for a service to making it something that's extremely practical that we could apply today, tomorrow, in our jobs with people who are unfamiliar with the concepts. So this commitment to practicality is really the deeper motivator for both Eric and I in what we do at work, in what we do with the online Slack community, uh, in what we do with all the materials and the blog posts and content that we create, because we truly believe that in order for service design to reach the next generation, and reach this um, area out here in the tech world, we have to make it more practical. We have to come up with a new way to apply service design. Uh, so, in, uh, uh, hold on, Megan, because I'm, I'm uh, really confused. Uh, there, there are so many examples of service design or des yeah, service design related project for, projects from the US, and now you're telling us that it's unknown and people will give you a blank stare? How's that yeah. possible? <laughs> so, so the 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 key to the like adoption of people who have downloaded our ebook there's been almost 3000 downloads in the last year and the slack community's got 1500 people and so maybe it's just her and i and the people we attract but the practicality comes down to every day every day we get some sort of email or message or some sort of communication from people who are working from the ground up um, in companies, in places that they don't know what to do and the resources and the projects and the case studies and the conference talks, that's not, it's not instructional, it's not practical. It's not, hey, I'm one person, I'm a business analyst, I'm a product manager at a huge cell phone company. This place couldn't be less design oriented, but I've heard about this service design. I don't know what to do. No one's gonna give me any money. I'm not gonna be able to hire anybody. How does one person um, bring service design and this thinking and mindset and start up a project and get some quick wins up on the board in a place that, you know, has no support for it. And, and so we're, maybe our audience is more of the, the lone practitioner or the people who see it from the bottom up and not the top down. But I think to your question, uh, when we're talking with all of these digital focused companies, you know, we have lots of friends and peers that work at Google, at Facebook, um, at LinkedIn, at, I mean, you name it, all any of these tech companies, these tech companies have not heard of or embraced service design. They might be doing some parts of it, but the farthest people have gotten in our world, in this kind of technical services world, uh, is, it, it, is that they have really advanced UX programs and right. they might have people doing this type of mapping or activities, but there's no organizational structure in place in these companies to support service design work. And there's nobody who's really embracing it as a, an official methodology or approach in, in these companies. So really, service de they're not hiring service designers. No. Nobody is. And you can, yeah. if, if, if anyone wants I to. I am. <laughs> Uh, oh, it can work for me. <laughs> I mean, we wrote about this on an uh, article on the Service Design Network, and what it comes down to is um, tech companies and tech companies, you know, software is eating the world. I mean, all these places out here are ubiquitous across the globe. And right now, the product and the interface and the visuals mm -hmm. and the interaction is what rules 
the decisions. We still see it as an app on a phone. We still see it yeah. as something in your browser. Even these companies that you would think have service design baked into their DNA, I think Uber, Lyft, Instacart, and the ones we talk about at service design conferences, yeah. they don't have service designers and they haven't actually acknowledged that that's what they're doing and they haven't officially formalized that role. And, and, and even though they might be designing um, for services and offering services, if you look at like what is service design, what is it trying to accomplish, um, they're backing their way into it, not mm -hmm. knowing that they're doing it. And what you do is you end up with um, a whole bunch of parts and pieces and kind of uh, ideas and, and you don't realize that you're creating this um, Frankenstein's monster <laughs> of pieces of UX and, and service design um, and it becomes incoherent and inconsistent to the point to where they end up you know, coming to our website or getting on the Slack saying, hey, we've got this, you know, got this thing. It kind of resembles what you're talking about. But at this point, there is no one who knows how to wrangle all this together and say, okay, now we truly know how to design for an end-to-end -end service from the human perspective and not from, wow, we've got all this cool technology. We've got AI, we've got voice recognition, we've got everything on the app. But you know what? No one took a step back and say, and said, how does this serve the need and the goal of the people who are going to use this, mm -hmm. you know, across their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And um, looking from uh, the work you've accomplished with practical service design in the past two and a half years, or when, when did it start something like that? What is the biggest difference you see between the moment you started and the moment where we're now? So we, we launched practicalservicedesign.com almost a year ago. So it was last November. And um, since then, we've seen an explosive growth in the Slack community. And I would bet that about 90, 95% of the people who are joining are people who are where we were maybe two or three years ago, who have just heard about service design and really, really want to, um, to get into it, but they don't know where to start. And it's, it's that helping the next generation of service designers kind of gain some traction find a way to practice this in their in their day, daily lives. So I think we have seen, you know, since starting this project, we have seen an incredible amount of interest and um, buzz and definitely the conversation is shifting. Mm -hmm. And more and more companies, people at companies that we know are really interested in um, learning more and adopting some of these practices and, and calling them by the name service design or, you know, formalizing it. I mean, my job is an example of that. Uh, a year and a half ago, I started this transition. I was working in the web team here as a, a web and product designer, and I was really pushing to do more service design. And it took me a while, but now I'm managing the service design team right, that right, I created here right. in the sport. So I think that the tides are turning. You know, it's mm -hmm. definitely shifting out here, but so it's taking. It's going to take a while. Uh, um, one final question about this topic you mentioned, uh, a Slack channel. Is it open for anyone to join? Yeah, it's it's um, it, it's open for anyone. We have people on every continent but Antarctica. So if there's any <laughs> service designers down there, please join. Yep. Um, so how, how can people join? What is the Slack channel name? If they go to uh, practicalservicedesign.com, you'll see the community tab there. There's a lot of resources there, and you can um, request an invite. Uh, it's it's free. It's open. We do screen because we want it to be a safe space. So, sure. you know, we let everyone in for the most part, but yeah. we want to make sure you're a real person. Yeah, and I hand check every <laughs> everyone who's that, who types in their info. I have to go and look up and make sure that yeah. They're real, and so I've I've single-handedly uh, invited fifteen hundred people over the last you, ten months. Uh, my my hand is killing you're, me. You're building a, a big network. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, I I would invite everyone uh, to join. So uh, you, you'll have fifteen hundred more people on the Slack channel in the next uh, week, probably. Let's move on to uh, to uh, topic number two, and I, I think it will be. Uh, uh, I hope it will be your turn to answer this question, um, uh, Eric. It's the topic of jobs to be done. Yeah. Um, yeah you have very uh, cryptic uh, topics. Uh, I'm gonna what use is the, the question? I'm going to use the dot, 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 because there's no, nothing that really fits. But Eric, tell us, 
what is jobs to be done and why why is this the, the hot topic that's been going around mm-hmm. in Slack for the last month and a half? Wow, man, I am so <laughs> glad you asked me that. So it's certainly something that is new to me and, and to a lot of people as a as a concept. It, it's not it's not new. Uh, it's been talked about in lots of different you know industry circles and a lot of you know academic um, environments and it's never really been connected to service design specifically like I'm looking at it now, but jobs to be done, it's just a name for kind of a, a, a theoretic construct that just very simply breaks down to people are trying to accomplish some job in their life. They just are trying to get something done. One super um, simple example from my real life is Intuit works with people who are self-employed, where they're just a sole proprietor. It's just one person gutting it out, trying to make things happen. And um, they, they, their job to be done is to, you know, save money, um, have better, uh, be better prepared to do taxes and optimize this, you know, really hard life of being self-employed. And so when they come to us, they're saying, I, I just need help be, being better at being self-employed. So I'm going to hire you and hire this product you have to help me do that. And so their job to be done isn't, it's not a user story in our product. It's not, it really, it has nothing to do with us. They're hiring us to provide a service to get them from, hey, I'm confused. I have to report my mileage to the IRS to deduct it to, hey, I saved this many dollars at the end of the year. And so jobs to be done says they're hiring us to perform or provide a service to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if that's what we're being hired to do, there are a lot of ways we can do that. Maybe it's an app, maybe it's, it's phone support, maybe it's a carrier pigeon. It doesn't really matter at first. And so once we have a concept of what is the job they're trying to accomplish, then we can go really broad Mm. and say, how do we design for that service? Yeah. And so how, there's lots of different ways we can do it. And then as service designers, as companies, as people, we can approach it um, with customer success in mind mm. because we want mm. them successful in mm. getting that job done. And it, it really liberates us from just thinking as we provide products and we, we sell mm. things to we truly perform and provide service to these people. And so it, it, I, as I connect jobs to be done with service design, it breaks it away from a persona journey mm-hmm. or a persona at all or a story mm-hmm. and into people have something much, much, much bigger than us, bigger than us people who sell things to them. And we truly need to be there to facilitate and assist. And that can take a lot of different forms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Megan? Yeah, so what I was surprised at was that over the last month and a half, as I mentioned, in our Slack community, this topic has been the hottest topic of discussion. And I think part of it is that, as we mentioned, in especially in this kind of digital services space, very development-driven companies, right? Um, use cases, user stories uh, are, are kind of the thing, the bread and butter of development-focused companies. And we really, our community has kind of landed on, on this, like, user stories don't cut it anymore. But jobs to be done as a different framework, a different lens for looking at um, whether you're satisfying the customer need uh, is a really useful new way to talk about it. And I have to say, uh, as I've been starting to integrate this more into my conversations and my job, Framing things this way has just opened up so many people's eyes on what you can do because it's not limited to like, I need to be able to click on this feature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So does this phrase liberate the whole conversation from screens, apps, and it takes it to, makes it channel agnostic? Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. And for digital, a digital services space, that's really, it's hard for them to make that leap. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, what have people found so far, or coming from the practical side, Mm -hmm. any practical tips or uh, ideas or insights that have emerged that people can use tomorrow? 
Yeah, so a lot of folks are using this framework to as as a um, as a way to code their research findings. Um, so, what are the, for example, what are the pains, gains, and jobs to be done mm-hmm. that you're finding in interviewing users? So, it's a frame from which to conduct qualitative research. Um, it's also if you kind of Google job story. There's a job story format that is out there. It's a simple template, but an alternative to a user story format. And I think that's an incredibly practical way to, to integrate jobs to be done into, into a development environment where maybe you use that to define your, your stories that get in your development backlog. So, so the, the, uh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Well, one other pr- practical application that has surprised me is that if you can get a way to explain it to other people in your company and to mm-hmm. leaders especially. Mm-hmm. Um, you have your little snippet, you put it in your presentation deck about what you want to do. And I think people who lead companies and organizations or parts of companies, when you explain it, and when I started to use the, the uh, phrase jobs and jobs to be done, they instantly understand it because mm-hmm. at a high level, that's how they see things because they might be managing multiple product teams. They're mm-hmm. seeing an ecosystem and a large end to end and yeah. they kind of feel it. But then kind of the the siloed myopic view of people who are focused really narrowly on a part of an app or a part of a screen, they, they've lost that big picture. Yeah. So as soon as yeah. I've said to people, hey, people are, customers are hiring our company to perform things and we happen to be based in software and financial services, but really, you know, we are just there to, to serve them reaching a much larger goal. And instantly everyone's like, yeah, yeah that's what I've been talking about. That's it, okay, let's, let's focus on that. And then yeah. within minutes, People are using the phrases; they're understanding it. And so, like, let's talk about practical. You're finally bringing people yeah, to the it opens the level. doors. It opens it, yes, doors it opens to the doors. service design conversation, and it's hard to do that. <laughs> I, I think it's also strongly links to the why of companies, right? The, the yeah. why are we here on Earth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exact. It's exactly it. We're, we're make, making money is an outcome of how successful you are at making customers successful in what they're trying to do. And they're not trying to buy your product. They're not, they don't even want to have to use it. Man, imagine if they could get it done and not have to do anything. That's kind of the ultimate goal, is to work yourself <laughs> yeah. out of existence. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, uh, interesting. Jobs to be done, uh, Google that. Uh, and uh, I, I think we can, it's interesting to see those crossovers coming from uh, the digital world and things like this moving into back into the service design world. I think we can learn still a lot from that. So uh, we have a third topic and um, it's called cyber services. All right, I got, I got, I'm going to jump. All right. Wow. Okay. You're just on point with these questions. All right. Uh, so Eric, you'll start. When will cyber services or digital services be ready to adopt service yeah. design? Wow, a great question. <laughs> Jeez. Um, so I, 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 I use the word cyber services. It's just a, a way to combine two things people are familiar with. Um, and, and so today, at least in our world, it's all, everything's digital. And the way we're trying to offer service, you know, we don't work for, for airlines, for hotels. We don't work for um, places that are real, uh, tangible, um, in real life, you know, human to human things. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. this stuff is human to machine. And if, if you look at the way things are going, Internet of Things, AI, you've got Siri and Cortana or Alexa or whatever that what it's called. Um, and you know, bots, bots are huge. Everyone's interacting with bots. So we're trying to come up with ways to serve people's needs through technology and sometimes taking the humanness out of one half of the equation and voice recognition and AI is inhuman. It's awesome, but we're trying to create these big connected digital services that are software driven. Yeah, yeah. And so how do we use service design and, and the, the ethos, um, which typically relies heavily, heavily on front stage and backstage actors, when we're turning those actors and into- And omni-channel too. Omni-channel, yeah. Right, where now we have from a lot of people's perspectives working in these software as a service companies, it's they're like, what do you mean omni-channel? Like, I, I, we're digital. Like, that's all we are. Yeah, so it's yeah. even just educating people on how you can scale the methodology yeah. takes time. So back to the question, Eric, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Um, I, I think right now the, 
the differentiators and the way people are going to start getting advantages is those who embrace the idea of a service mindset, of serving a need, of how do you um, perform service. And maybe it is through AI, maybe it is through bots, maybe it is through voice recognition, home appliances that can turn your lights on and unlock your doors. But we have to accept the fact that those things act in service of a larger need. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually wants voice recognition if it doesn't perform something that enhances their lives. And, and we're focused, I mean, everyone's focused on what we can do and not how we apply it humanely yet, which mm -hmm. is why, you know, the internet of things is sometimes called the internet of shit. Nothing works <laughs> yeah. and nothing yeah. works together. Yeah. So, but I, I guess that's, that's for me, the, the key of uh, this whole talk, uh, applying the humane part to let's say touch points in our service design world that are not where people are not involved and still making those humane, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, you, we're, we're trying to come up with scalable, um, very smart technological means and taking the humans out of the equation. And if you want to serve people through an AI voice recognition that mm -hmm. talks back to you and simulate a human voice, as closely as possible, you really have to think, where is the humanity in this and how do yeah. we simulate yeah. this is acting as um, something that's performing a service? What's my larger job to be done <laughs> as a person when it's all digital? Yeah, and, and the, the big change that is happening is that uh, those digital touch points that we are creating used to be very uh, one way as in they wouldn't interact with you, but now with bots and AI, you actually start to get some sort of interaction and yep. uh, an interaction that is uh, that we also have with humans. So I, I, I guess the big change isn't there. It's, it's not like a click and then not, nothing yeah. happens, but you, are, you sort of have a two-way communication with the technologies yes. you were talking about. And these and the companies that are creating all of these digital services, they're they're set up in product silos often, and um, we don't see designers working across across those touch points yet, because you're mm -hmm. still on the team that makes the app or makes the this or makes that yeah. feature. And I mean, silos are good and necessary for development, but we need a new role. We need these companies to start adopting service design as a new function in their organization. Yeah. Um, we've been reading the Org Design for Design Orgs book, uh, which lays it out so plainly and simply. If you haven't read it, check it out. There's a diagram where they, they talk about how do you scale up a design team and how do you have service design, where does it fit? And it's awesome. It's awesome to see that laid out and published and put out there in the world for these companies to start considering. But it really, we, we're still at the beginning of this change Adaptive Path is definitely a leader in the space. There's others that are leaders in this space, but um, many of these big companies are, aren't there yet. Well, yeah, you'll, yeah. well, just one little add on to that is in the world of digital, you've got very deep um, focused people who are designing for experiences, but I, I have yet to find hardly any, uh, maybe you know, senior principal level contributor designers that are working horizontally across all this, working end to end, building yeah. bridges. So if you're out there, get in touch with us. <laughs> yeah, get in touch. <laughs> Wanna connect. I mean, that's, that's what's missing in the digital world is that I think people are scared to say, but if you're designing um, for experiences, how can you not be focused on one thing? How can you focus on everything horizontally? And yet customers, mm -hmm. they only experience things horizontally yeah. over time, either over months or over minutes. And it's or like, years. Who's, who's the person in our company that's shepherding the people along mm -hmm. these touch points? Who's designing that? And it's like, uh, yeah. no. Yeah, that, that's, this has been a really hot topic on the, on the show. Who is responsible for the total customer experience? Is there someone responsible? Should there be someone responsible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we're moving through our time. And uh, this is a question that I, I really want to ask you before we leave. You've had the experience, the, the, uh, the honor to, to enter the surf design world not so long ago and uh, have a community of 1,500 people around you. And I'm really curious if they ask you, uh, guys, listen, I want to get into surf design. What is the ultimate tip? What would you say to them? We get this question 
every day. I mean, this is, this is, um, a constant question. And I mean, the first answer is, is join the community because you can put your questions out there and you'll get an answer. You'll get somebody answering you. So having that community access is really important. Um, we've created a, a service design 101 page on our website with some links. And so there's a couple books we recommend. Um, the main book is service design for business by the live work guys. That's our number one book recommendation. If you are just getting into service design, highly recommend reading at least the first half of that book. Um, and, and just start doing service design. I think that's the other like big tip is, is you have to find a way to try to practice this and it might mean getting out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and taking charge of an end to end, um, perspective that nobody's in charge of yet. And that you thought wasn't part of your role and responsibility. Yeah. So when I first got into service design, um, I just decided to make up a project and do it and involve my team. And, you know, I wasn't in charge of the whole request and onboarding process for new customers, but I did it anyway. And I think for those who out there who are really struggling to find that first place to start, you know, come join the Slack and throw out some ideas and we'll give you feedback because that, that's what mm -hmm. that community is about. And if I were to, if I were to, a lot of times, if I were to just tell people like, what do I actually do? Like, what am I going to do tomorrow? Um, what I've seen work at tons of companies, big, big companies that have people that come in and they're, they're drowning in the size of their company. What I'm going to tell people then, and what I'm going to tell them now here on the service design show is, Figure out how to build a blueprint of some experience, um, get get a nice big printer, you know, print it out, you know, do the project, have it ready and go find ways for executives to see it. Because I've seen this in some of the biggest, I mean, Fortune 50 companies where some little small time person will do it mm -hmm. and executives walk by and people walk by and it's the first time they've seen these experiences that might be responsible for hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and they, they look at it. Mm -hmm. and, and where I first one of the biggest wins I've ever had was to have kind of this crappy blueprint that I printed out on pieces of paper and then taped it all together because I didn't have a big printer. And I brought it into an executive review with someone, an EVP who reports right to Intuit CEO. And I showed it to him and I put it in front of him on the conference room table and he looks at it. And it was like, he's a pretty intimidating guy. And he looks at it and he's like, this is what I've been talking about when I say end to end. And that was it. That was, it. That was the start of everything because mm -hmm. it was this simplistic visual that he knew about in his head as the boss of the bosses, but he doesn't sit and work in this every day. And then there's all these people who do work in it every day, but they're too low to see the big picture. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you had executives and contributors on the same page with the shared knowledge, looking at the literal exact same physical thing. And that took us two days worth of getting together, mapping it out, coming up with some weird format. This is like years ago when I first started it into it and just being able to see that it, it awakened everybody to like, you know, mm -hmm. serve as blueprinting. And so, so make it evident. Just make, yeah, just bring it. Even Put it if in your face. That's basically your tip. Make sure they stumble over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, to put yourself out there and put your work out there. Even if it's messy, even if it looks like post-it notes, because I can promise yeah. nobody knows the end to end. I, I have seen a does. single company that <laughs> can sit down and say, this is what happens to our customers from awareness to either they abandon us and leave or they become you know, multi-year. I mean, Intuit's got customers that have been using us for 25, 30 years. Talk That's about crazy. a journey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, final, final question. Um, I'm sure you still have a lot of questions, uh, things that keep you awake. What are the topics that you are thinking about? What are, what are your big questions? <laughs> Name big one. Question. <laughs> one. Or do you want us to focus on the things that keep us awake at night? Because there might be a difference there. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's, uh, let's keep them on track with service design related things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the, the things that that keep me awake at night, but are also on my mind all the time right now, as I'm building out my team are, you know, how do I prove the value of what we're doing? So I'm going from, um, last week it was me and one other person. And this week I'm the manager and I have an open rec and I've got all this expectation from my company 
to prove, because I've made all these promises that service design is the right thing for us to be doing. So how do I really show the value of service design? I know that's a big topic for a lot of people. Um, it's how do you measure and communicate yeah. that value? Yeah. That's going to be on my mind, I'm sure, forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's the big thing right now. <laughs> and, and for you, Eric? Um, for me, one of the one of the scariest parts of service design, what keeps me up at night, and if, if people are thinking like, oh, yeah, I want to move to the Bay Area. I'm going to do it out there. That sounds awesome. I would say right now that person would be ahead of their time, and you're really narrowing places that are going to get it and really narrowing down where mm-hmm. you're going to be able to work. And it, it's scary when you're doing something that you believe in and you can really see it starting to work. But it, it, it's almost like, look, no one's going to hire you to do that because we don't get it. And, and so it's like, oh, geez. You have to we, make your own way. Yeah, you're, you're specializing yourself <laughs> out of a job in something that in 10 years, you'll be, you'll be, you know, you'll have the keys to the kingdom. But right now, yeah. you really have to find inspired, innovative, um, forward thinking places who can see, you know, I, I, like me personally, I'm not worried about how things are today. I'm worried about how they are going to be in the future. And you're going to have to find special people who also believe in that as much as you believe in it. And that's what keeps me up at night is, uh, did I over specialize? <laughs> Did I over specialize? I'm finding that people, uh, well, you know, it's it's still, uh, we've been doing this for the, the last 10 years uh, and we're still, uh, we, we still need to explain and show the value to people. And I guess this won't be over uh, tomorrow. And, I, and yeah. I, I'm really happy that a lot of people see the value and, um, and are interested in that. And we need to spread the word. That's the only uh, thing we can do, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that's that's kind of what we're all about is helping helping make space for that next generation to take root. Mm-hmm. Awesome, um, Megan, Eric, thanks for your time. Um, well, it was great talking about uh, these topics, and uh, these were really uh, uh, interesting topics that haven't been uh, on the show that much. So uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. Yes, it was thank fun. You. What are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Eric and Megan? How do you make service design practical? Let us know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, check out some of the past episodes and subscribe to the channel. We bring you a new video every two weeks. For now, thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.